morning, good afternoon, and good night to some of you. My name is Mazze Innocent and Kendall Emmanuel, a bona fide active member of IPOB, and we are preaching the gospel of redemption in order for us to restore our nation once again. Here with me, I'm going to read a book from one of our best authors, a Biafran, called Chinua Achebe. So I want you to please welcome your friends and your families in order to join this program in the nearest future. So this book is talking about the history of we Biafran, what we passed through before we uh, lost the Biafran war and uh, Nigeria in 1967-1970. But thank you very much, Ashley Listing. I also encourage you to go and get the book, if you may. It's called There Was a Country. And it's talking about the Afra, what we passed through before now. So what I'm going to read today, I'm going to start from the introduction down to the uh, uh, meeting. Hold on. Mm, down to the meeting Christy and her family we're going to take this in an episode reading so that we can be able to finish this book the total number here it's about uh, uh, 300 and uh, 329 or 330. Okay, introduction says, an Igbo proverb tells us that a man who does not know where the rain began to beat him cannot say where dries his body. The rain that beat Africans began four to 500 years ago from the trade to the Berlin Conference of, 19, of, of 1885. That controversial get, gathering of the world leading European powers precipitated what we now call the scramble of Africa, which created a new boundaries that did violence to African Asian society and resulted in tension pro modern states. It took place without African consultation or representation, to say the least. The Great Britain was handed the area of West Africa that will later become Nigeria like a piece of chocolate cake at a birthday party it was once of the most population popular re region on african continent with over 250 ethnic group and distinct languages the northern part of the the northern part of the country was the seat of several Asian kingdoms, such as the Kanem, Borno, which Shehu Usman Danfodio and his jihadists ab absorbed into Muslims' Fulani Empire. The middle belt of Nigeria was the locus, locus of the glorious North Kingdom. It will Renowned Terra Costa sculpture, the Southern Protectorate was home to some of the religious most sophisticated civilization in the West. The Oyo and Ife Kingdom on straight. Majestically, and in the Middle West, 
the incorporable Benin Kingdom elevated artistic distinction to a new level across Niger River in the east. The Calabar and the Nri Kingdom flourish if the Berlin Conference seal their fate. The amalgamation of the southern and the northern pro-territory inextricable complicated Nigeria destiny animist. Muslim and Christian alike were held together by a delegate. Some way, some says artificial lactics. Britain's indirectly rule was a great success in northern and the western Nigeria where affairs of state within these new dispensions continue as had been the case for centuries. With one exception, there was a new sovereign Great Britain to whom all vassal place play and into whose confess all taxes were paid. Indirectly rule in Igbo land proved far more challenging to implement colonial rule function through a newly created and incongruous establishment of Warren Chief. A deeply flawed arrangement that effectively confused and corrupted the evil democratic spirit. African post colonial disposition is the result of the people who have lost the habit of ruling themselves. We have also had difficulties running the new system forced upon us at the dawn of independence by our colonial master because the West was had a long but unevil engagement with the continent. It is imperative that it understand that what happened to Africa. It must also play a part in the, the solution. A meaningful solution will require the goodwill and the concentrated efforts on the part of all those who share the weight of African historical burden. Most members of my generation who were born before Nigeria's independence remember a time when things are very difficult. Nigeria was once a land of great hope and progress, a nation with immense resources at its disposal. Natural resources, yes, but even more so human resources. But the Biafran War changed the course of Nigeria. In my view, it was a cate cataclysmic experience that changed the history of Africa. There is no connection between the particular distress of war, the particular tension of war, and the kind of literacy response in the Inspire. I choose to express myself in that period through poetry, as opposed to other gerners. My Biafran poems and other poems are collected in two volumes. Bevar, so brother, poem, which was published as Christmas in Biafra and other poems in Africa in America in 1971 and collected 
poem in 2004. As a group, these poems tell the story of the African struggle and suffering. I have made the conscious choice to just take Paul's poem tree and prose in this book to tell complementary story in two art of forms. It is for the sake of the future of Nigeria, for our children and grandchildren that I feel it is, is important to tell Nigerian story, Biafran story, our story, my story. I begin this story with my own coming of age in an earlier and in some respective a more innocent time. I do this both to bring leaders on family, readers on family with this uh, landscape into at a human level to be upon about some of the source of my own perspective. Now we're going to part one. What we just read now is just introduction. Now, part one, pianos of a new frontier. Look at it here. Pianos of a new frontier. This is part one. We're going to part, we're going to part one right now. Oh, pianos of a new frontier. My father was in the last third of the 19th century an area of great cultural, economic, and religious upheaval in Igbo land. His mother had died in her second childbirth, and his father, Achebe, a refugee from a bitter civil war, did not long survive his wife, and so my father was raised by his maternal uncle, Udo. It was this maternal uncle, as, as faith would have it, who received in his compound the first party of English clergy in his town, the new arrival missionary of a new religion, Christianity, had already conquered the Yoruba heartland and were expanded their footprint in Igbo land. The rest of the southern Nigeria with their potent, irres irresistible topic, tonic of even galism and education. A story is told of how Udo, a very generous and tolerant man finally asked his visitors to move to a public playground on account of their singing, which he considered to dismal for a living man's compound. But he did not discourage his young nephew from associating with the singers. My father was an early Christian convert and a good student by 1904. He was deemed to have received enough education at St. Paul's Teachers College in Oka to be employed as a teacher and an evangelist in the Anglican mission. He was a brilliant man who deeply valued education. and read a great deal, mainly Bible and religious book, periodical and almanacs from the church, almanacs from the church missionary society. My mother, Janet, and her church, who Bunam, was an extraordinary woman as a student of the legendary missionary and evangelist, Miss Edith Werner, 
she received a primary school education which was a phenomenal feat at the time especially for a woman my mother joined my father on his travel through much of Igbo land to spread the gospel my parents were almost the first of their people to successfully integrate uh, traditional value with the education and new religious brought by the Europeans. I still marvel at how wholeheartedly they embrace strangers from thousands of miles away with their different customs and beliefs. It is from these two outstanding and courageous individuals that my my five siblings, Frank, Zenobia, John, Augustine, and Grace, and I got our deep love for education and pursuit of knowledge. The Magical Years. The Magical Years, you can see. We're going to get magical years. Magical years. On November 16th, 1930, in Nobi, near my hometown of Ogidi province, then soon we hear me into a ward at a cultural crossroad. By then, a long-standing clash of Western and African civilization had generated deep conversation and struggle between their respective languages, religion, and culture. Crossroad possesses a certain dangerous potency. Anyone born there must wrestle with their multi-headed spirit and return to his or her people with the bones of trumpetic vision of accept. As I have, life intimidatively mysterious. My initiation into the complicated world of Ndibo was at the hand of my mother and my elder sister, Zenobia, who furnished me with a number of with a number of wonderful stories from our ancient Igbo tradition. The tale were steeped into intrigue or spice with oral acrobatics and song, but always resolute in their moral message. My favorite story Start the tortoise Mbe and celebrated his mysterious escape. As a child, sitting quietly, mesmerized story time books on a whole new world of meaning and importance. I realized, reminiscing about this event. That is that it is little wonder I decided to become a storyteller. Later, in my literacy career, I traveled back to the magic of the storytelling of my youth to write my own children book, How the Leopard Got His Cloth, Chike and the River the drum and children's story and the flood. When I think about, when I think about my mothers, the first thing that comes to my mind is how clearly the description, the strong silent type fit her mother was neither talkative nor timid but seems to exist on the several planes, often quickly escaping into the inner casement of her mind, where she engaged 
in deep reflective thought. It was from her, it was from her that I learned to appreciate the power and the solace in silence. Mother's education proper her for a leadership and the and she distinguish herself in the church and as the head of the group of expert women from an ancient town of Oka who were married in Ogidi, she always treated others with respect and educate and exerted a calm self-confidence. Mother brought a remarkable understanding elegance to every activity which she engaged. She had a particular attractive way of making sure she got her point across without being overbearing or intimidating. It is her peaceful determination to tackle barriers in her wall that nailed down a very important element of my development, the willingness to bring about change gently. We Christians thought the interreligious struggle was still evident in our time. There was occasions where one would suddenly suddenly realized they were outside and one was on and and i beg your pardon and one was on one or another perhaps the most important event that illustrated this was what has come to be known in my family as the kola not ancient the story came out that a neighbor who was a relative of mine and someone the Christian would refer as to a hidden was passing on the road one day and watched quickly as my mother pulled down a, a small collar not branch from a tree in her compound and picked a rib fruit. Now, one often forget that there were taboos about picking cola nuts. Traditionally, no one was allowed to pick them from the trees. They were supposed to ripe, fall, and then be collected from the ground. And by men, not by women. The cola nut was a sacred fruit and had a very distinct and distinguished role to play in Igbo life and culture. The neighbor reported this decision to the menfolk who then exaggerated the insult to our traditional, but more insisted that she had every right to pick the fruit particularly from a tree in her own compound. I did not think up to that moment that my mother was a fighter. There was pressure to punish my mother, though it did not go anywhere in the end. Looking back, one can appreciate the fact that she had won a battle for Christianity, women's rights, and freedom. The most powerful memories of my father are the ones of him working as a cat guest and a teacher. He read constantly and had a small library. My father also had a number of college and maps hanging on the walls and books that he encouraged his children to read. He would often walk up, walk us through the house, telling story linked to each prized possessions. It was from him that I was exposed 
to magic in the main title of William Shakespeare, a mind summer night dream and to an Igbo translation of John Bonnier's The Pilgrim's Progress. The Bible played an important role in my education. My parents often read passages out loud to us during prayer time and encourage us when we shall all able to read and memorize several passages. Suddenly, school continued this tradition of Christianity evangelist education, and this time with several other children from the village. Education was so important to my father and that he often would sponsor a bright child from an underprivileged background, reminding us that he too, as an orphan, had received providence benefactors. The center of our family's activities was St. Philip's Church, Ogidi, a large Gothic style parish church that my father helped establish. It was constructed on impressive open uli or piece of often grass on the outskirts of Ogidi. It was an imposing structure for a time built with wood, cement, mud, and stones. Local law hold that my father look, uh, took part in the building of the church from its foundation. My father also helped conduct Sunday service translates sermons in Igbo into Igbo and arranged the sanctuary and um, vestly. I remember waking up early to help out carry his bag for him as we set out at Cockcrow for the parish church. Eucharistic on Sundays often lasted more than two hours. For those who were not asleep, by end of the proceedings, the first fire bring stone sermons from the pulpit made attendance wash worldwide. Worldwide. There was an occasionally outburst of uncontrollable laughter when the rector an Englishman enthusiastically drank all the remaining wines at the end of the communion, wiping his mouth with the back of his hand. A crowd famous was the inaccurate translation of Igbo words into English, such as the word Ike, which is an Igbo word that, me that can mean strength or but talks depending on the skills of or himself of the translation i repeat i beg your pardon depending on the skill of mischief of the translator i can say that my whole artic artistic career was probably sparkled by this tension between the Christian religions of my parents, which we followed in our home, and the restricting other religions of my ancestors, which fortunately for me was still active outside my home. I still have access to a number of relatives who had not converted to Christianity and were called hidden by the new converts. When my parents were not watching, I would often sneak 
off in the evening to visit some of these relatives. They seem to be very content in their traditional ways of life. They seem to become, uh, I beg your pardon. They seem to be very content in their traditional ways of life and worship. Why would they refuse to be to become Christianity like everyone else around them? I was intent on finding out. My great uncle Udo Osini was able to describe both worlds, world with great comfort. He held one of the highest title in all of the Igbo land, Ozo. I was very interested. I was very interested in my great and uncle religion, and taking talking to him was an enriching experience. I would give up anything for that, including my own narrow, my own narrow, if you like. Christianity background. In Igbo land, because mostly there are many gods, a person will be in good state with one god and not the other. Ogugu, Ogugu kill a person despite an excellent relationship with Udo. As a young person, that sort of Complexity main title to me. A later understanding will reveal the humid humility of traditional religion with greater clarity. Igbo saying and proverb are far more valuable to me as a human being in understanding the complexity of the world than the doctrinary self-religious strain of the Christian faith. I was taught this other religion is also far more arti artistically satisfying to me. However, as a catechist son, I had to suppress this interest in our tradition, to some extent, at least, the religious component. We were church people, after all, helping the local, helping the local church spread the Christianity. The relationship between my father and his uncle Udo was instruct instructive to me. There was something deep and mysterious about it. Judging from the Reverence I heard in my father's voice whenever he spoke about his old uncle. My father was a man of a few words, and I have always regretted that I did not ask him more questions. But he took pain to tell me what he thought I needed to know. He told me, for instance, in a rather obliquely ways of his one attempt to convert his uncle Udo. It must have been in my father's youthful heady prosperity day, his uncle point to the awesome role of insignia of his tree title, each year also. Udo what shall I do to this? He asked my father. It was an it was an awesome question. Let me sip some water. Sorry. Thank <laughs> you.
Now, um, it was an it was an awesome question. He has essentially asked, "What do I do to who I am? What do I do to history?" An often child born into adversity. Here to the common commotion, barbaric and rampart on heels of a constant in diversity. It was not all surprising that my father would welcome the name the proffered by diversity and interpreter of a new word of God. But my great uncle, a, re- a leader in his community, a moral, open-minded man, a prosperous man who had prepared such a great face when he took the other title that his people gave him a praise name for it, was he to throw all that away because some stranger from far away says so. At first glance, it seems to me that my father, a deeply religious man, was not tolerant of our ancient tradition and religions. As he got older, however, I noticed that he became more openly accommodating of the old ways of doing things. By this time, he had developed quite a reputation as a pious, disciplined, honest catechist. He was widely known as Onye Nkuzi, the teacher. And the villagers found him very trustworthy. Stranger would often drop all valuable at our house for further safekeeping. Those two, those two, my father and his uncle formed the dialectic that I inherited. Udo stood fast in what he knew, but he also left room for my faith solve many problems, but by no means all. As a young person, my perspective of the world benefited. I think from this dictatorship, I was questioned in an intellectual way, which was what's right. Or better, I was simply more interested in exploring the essence, the meaning world view of both religions by approaching the issues of tradition, culture, literature, and language of our ancient civilization. In that manner, without judging but crossnizing a treasure trove of discovery was open up to me. I often have period of oscillative faith as I grew older. Period of doubts when I quickly pondered and I deeply questioned the absolutistic technique teaching or the interpretation of religion. I struggled with the I struggle with the characters of Christianity. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not its accuracy, because as a writer, one understands that there should be such latitude. But 
the solution, the accessibility of this meaning, the lack of the opinion for the outsider. The other, I believe that this question had subsequently deeply influenced my writing. This is not particular or particularly unique. As many writers from Du Bois to Camus, Satra, and Baldwin to Marison have also struggled with these conundrums of the outsider, the other, in the other ways. In their respective locales, my father had a lot of praise for the missionary and their message. And so do I. I prime beneficiary of the education that the, the missionary made a major component of their experience, expa, uh, enterprise. But I have also learned a little more skepticism about them than my father had any need for. Those does it matter? I ask myself that century before European Christians sit down to us in ships to deliver the gospel and save us from darkness. The other, the other European Christians also selling in ship, delivering, delivering us to the trans, transatlantic slave trade and unleashing darkness in our world. Every generation must recognize and embrace their text. It is particularly designed by history and by providence to perform. From where I stand now, I can see the enormous value of my great uncle Udo Osin and his example of fidelity. I also salute my father, Isaiah Achebe, for the 35 years he served as a Christian evangelist and for all the benefit his work and the work of others like him. Taught to our people by my father, great gift to me was the love of education and his recognition that whether we look at one human family or we look at human society in general, growth can only incrementally. Now, we are now reading from what it says there, uh, primary exposure. Primary exposure. Look at it. Primary. Oh, sorry about that. See that? Primary exposure. Primary exposure. I began my formal education at St. Philip Central School in 1936 or thereabout. The school had pupils from Ogidi and the surrounding towns. Most who attended classes there had to walk alone several miles every day to get to class. But things were simpler and safer in those days. And there was never a story of child abduction or any unsavory incident that I can recall. I enjoyed school a great deal and was a hard-working populist. I remember looking forward excitedly to new lessons and I informed from our teachers. Occasionally, we received instruction from individuals who were not, uh, who were not on the staff of St. Philip. One particular humorous event stand out on a hot and 
humid day during the wet season, the wet season, our geography teacher decided to move our entire class outside the school shade of a large mango tree. After setting up the backbone, he proceeded to give the classes a lesson on the geography of a Great Britain. The village madman came by and after standing and listening to the teacher's lesson for a short while, walked up to him, snatched the chalk from his hand, wiped the blackboard and proceeded to give us an extended lesson on Ogidi, my hometown. Amazingly, the teacher let all this take place without incident. Looking back, it is instructive in my estimate that it was so-called madman whose clever perspective for first identified the incongruity of our situation that the populace would, be, would benefit not only from a colonial education but also by instructive about their own history and civilization. The headmaster of St. Philip's, Philip Central School, was a col colorful, extraordinary, very evil man, Jonathan Obidike Okogu. He was also known as Ara Emeya Eme Naono Apoko Okongu or Ara Emeya Eme. Shot. He was one of a handful of Nigerians who had attended the distinct the distinction of headmaster of an elementary school. His reputation as a discipline Naira discipline discipline Nairan sent chew down the kinds of all puppies throughout the Eastern religions. St. Philip School told her that he unsparkled every puppies in every class in all each forms of the entire school in one day and continue very next day where he left off. Okungu on others method produced top scores on exams, which place his student in the best board school throughout the West Africa, and made him one of the most sought out headmaster in the entire region. Okungu was transferred to St. Michael's School, Aba, a well-recorded school in one of the largest commercial cities in the eastern Nigeria, which is Biafra land. Chike, Moma, and Dr. Francis Ubuanu, who later became student at the government college, Omahe completed their elementary school education there, my wife, Christy Okoli, for a brief period, also attended that school. Christy recalled being the only one in her class to evade Mr. Okongu's cane during a spelling lesson. The word that produced a score or of sore bottom was because for every word missed the popular 
were rewarded. With a sparking, the majority of the puppy came up become because because it because they never forgot how to spell because ever again. Okungu was a pillar of the Igbo community for his time. He was extra, he was extensively admired for his achievement in education. It is difficult to convey just how important teachers like Okungu, who was seriously committed to their work, get to the Igbo community, particularly as that is, is no longer the case today. Education white man knowledge was a collective aspiration of the entire community. It was the path to individual and family success. And Headmaster Okungu and others like him held the proverbs, hold the proverbian key to the kingdom. Okungu was a general, generous man and they sponsored a number of children in various schools in Nigeria and abroad. There is a well-known story of how he sent one of his nephew to America to study. He clearly had great, great experience for his nephew. In those days, men like Okungu who had means sent family members abroad to advance their education with hope that they will return and improve the standard of living of the family and, and community. Apparently his nephew apparently his nephew did not quite make it. He, he did quite make it, I beg your pardon. Apparently, this nephew did quite well and earned his PhD. Sadly, just before he returned to Nigeria, he became quite ill and died. He became quite ill and died. The last time I saw Okungu was at the train station in Enugu, the capital of the eastern region, which is Biafra land. He came there to see his son, Sonny, Chuk Okungu, of the government college, Omar here. He was standing, leaning on the railing with his right hand, holding onto the bars. He spotted me from the distance and called me over, introduced me to his son, and asked me to take care of Sonny at Government College. He struck me that the senior Okungus appeared unhappy. The loss of his nephew, Clary, had taken a lot out of him. Leaving home. Now we are now on the living home, you see? I don't know if you can see, living home. For a, for a brief period of, for a, for a brief period, I spent some time living with my oldest brother, John. Was living with my older brother, John, who was working at Central College, Nekede, as a teacher. My father had wanted John to follow in his footsteps and become a teacher too. John was a gifted student and successful for few that dream. It was John who quite wisely thought my own education would be in his if I lived with him in a school environment. So I packed up my few belongings and set out with my older brother to Nekede. 
near the present capital of Imo, Oweri, about 18 miles from my ancestral home of Wikidi. That was the first year I spent away from my parents. And at the time, Nekere seems like a dictat distant country. John enrolled me into a central school where I prepared for my entrance examination into government college. The religious centers for the examination St. Michael School and John helped me make the trip from Nekede to Abba. Before I arrived, Okongos apparently announced to the student of St. Michael in Igbo, Onyewa, Onwe, Onwe Onye Ogidi, Anna, Akwa, Albert, Achebe. The, the lost translation is, there is a young man called Albert Achebe from Ogidi, who is coming to take the, ex the entrance examination with student in this school. He will beat all of you in all subjects in the examination. This glory did not endear me to my fellow pupils at St. Michael, but piqued the interest of future long-time friend like the brilliant Chike Mora, Mona. Afterwards, I returned to Naked for the remainder of secondary year. Naked was a treasure trove of Igbo culture. Our ancient tradition continued to fascinate me and I sought an internet alternative education outside the classroom from the local village. The old men in Nekede spoke respectively about the Otamiri River and the chief deity, for which it is named the Otamiri deity is a female who, according to legend, purified the land of evil and would clean the lives of interlopers who wandered into the area of mischief. If it was said that no one had ever known drawn in her waters under they had committed evil deed or contemplated diabolical acts. I was in Naked that I was it was in Naked, I beg your pardon, it was in Naked that I was introduced to Mberi and the sophistication of evil phenomenal logical thought. The Owere Ibo, who lived near Owere Township, engaged in the process and celebration of life. A mortar, a mort house was often built with decorated walls and crowned with either corrugated metal or a thatched roof made of intricately woven palms, leaves, and spine. Inside the center stage on an elevated mold platform, an observed mold with fine life-size sculptures of the constituent parts of the Owera Igbo world. I will say that is such as Otamiri and the Ani, the Earth Goddess, and men, women, children, soldiers, animals, crops, 
foreigners, mainly Europeans, all cited the inclusions of the European a great tribute to the virtues of African tolerance and accommodation was an example of the position acknowledged of strangers who has ventured into their minds. There will also be depiction from ancient mythology as well as source diseases and other unpleasant things. The purpose of this act form was to invoke protection from the gods for the people thought the celebration of the world these villagers live in, in other words, through act as celebration. The formative year at Omwahia and Ibadan. The formative year, see? the formative year at Omwahia and Ibadan. It was not long after my foray into metaphysical world of Oweri, Igbo, that I was to leave my traditional classroom in the forest of Nekede for the second stage of my former education, secondary school. There was a certain sense of mystery that I feel when I look back to those times because things were encountered in life that leave the greatest impression on us as are unusual, not clear. My elder brother John was a very brilliant man. I still say he was the most brilliant of all of us. He was very eloquent and he would correct my spoken English. I often wonder about John. How did he gain such control of the English language? John had not been to university, but had received a secondary school education at Dennis Memorial Grammar School, DMGS, in our nature. All my brothers attended this legendary school, which had been built by the Church Missionary Society. Frank had attended John went there and it was where Augustine was to go. The school was very imposing with its red earth brick, limestone and wood colonial architecture and ancestral guard by Doris columns and cathedral height roof and other uniforms. The dark red shirt, pants, and caps was very impressive. DMGS was the place. In 1945, I took a national entrance examination for the British public schools of the day. I also had admitted to Dennis Memorial Grammar School and Governance College, Omaha. Now, when when John was told that I had been admitted to both Omaha and his Almata with full scholarship to both, he suggested I go to Omaha, though Omaha location was very remote its status as a government college set up by the colonial government, resume my parents. Following a period of deliberation and debate and consciousness in my family was that I go to this fairly new school in faraway Umahia. 
even though we had no relative there. I also probably wish to go to government college somewhere here because I wanted to do something different from my brothers. Omar here, a new elite boarding school established in 1929, was rapidly developing a reputation as the Eton of the East. And I emphasize receiving an education akin to the Royal of England. The Anglican protestants of the Church Missionary Society, as well as the Methodist, Baptist, and Roman Catholic, had built missionary schools throughout the South and Middle Belt of Nigeria. This new government college is exemplified by Government College Omohia and Government College Ibadan were built to continue the tradition of educational excellence established by even older secondary schools, King's College and Queen's College. Both in Lagos, between these four schools, King's College and Queen's College Omohia Ibadan had some of the very best secondary school in the British Empire. As a group, these schools were better and though financially had excellent amateurs, were staffed with first-rate teachers, custodians, instructors, cooks, and librarians of of course, today, under Nigerian control, this school, for, uh, this school have fallen into disrepair and are nothing like they were in, the, in their hair days. Shortly after taking the national entrance examination, I received a letter in the mail address to me explaining that I was under consideration for admission to Umia here. That had to be the first letter I had ever received in my life. I traveled to Umia here to interviewed by a former principal, a very tall and large man. I believe his name was Mr. Tops. My interviewer first asked why I did not reply to the letter we wrote me offering me admission. I said, I did not know what I was supposed to reply. And he picked up a copy of the letter and read, please acknowledge receipt. I did not know the meaning of that phrase. I said to myself, well, I am not getting in at this point, but after a little more conversation, he gave me admission to his school. As the first day of school approached, I was overtaken by a sense of excitement and tra trepidation. I had never been to Umar here before, my interview. In fact, I did not know of anyone who had been to Umafia. I was to travel first by lorry to Enugu and then by train to Umafia. I arrived at Umafia railway station alone. A man and his son approached me. The man asked me whether I was going to Umafia. The village where the secondary school was located, and I replied, Yes, sir. He was going there too with his son. There, they had hired two bicycles, and he suggested I ride with them. I carried his son, who was considerably smaller than I. I, on the 
I am I on the handler handle bars of the bicycle to Umuahia, which was about three and a half miles off from the railway stations. As we spelt off, I kept thanking I kept thanking this man for the help. I was completely surprised at the hospitality and warmth that greeted me on my first day in school. He soon became friend naturally because he was the first Omar here I had met. Later that semester, I would discover that this lead who would become a renewed physician, Dr. Francis Ibuono, had come to Umwaja from St. Michael School, Abba. It was considerably the very same school that another very close friend of mine, Chike Moma, had attended. The Umwaja experience. The Umwaja experience, is it? The Umwaja experience. The Umwaja experience. Government College Umwaja was built on a sprawling, sparkling campus at the fringe of a tropical forest. The ground where dotted with with large evergreen trees on wall maintained dawn crossroads by hand craft stone pathways that were bordered by manicured hedged the buildings wood frame bricks and scuttle Burglos surrounded by white verandas were adorned with shorter windows and crawled with large metal roof. The, the vaulted ceiling design also enhanced ventilation and tempered the tropical heat. The most of the structure rested on elevated foundation of or stiffed to protect them from flood and to keep terminates, white animals, serpent and rodents out. There were three dominatory at Umar here the Niger, Nila, and the schoolhouses. I was assigned to Niger school and once there, unpacked my few belongings in my dormitory locker. In my time, the school had about 200 students and our life were strictly regimented with literally every hour's slavery for an anciently. One of the most thrilling peculiation, pe peculiarity of the Umafia experience was the culture of playing cricket. Not all secondary school in the area played the game. Soccer was far more common commonplace. Cricket matches were often organized between government school and Omar on Omar Hair King's College, Lagos Government College, Ibadan and few other elite secondary schools. Omar here had a huge cricket field which had a beautiful grass Lane and a clear, a clear sand pitch area with wooden wicked wickets 
It was cared for almost more carefully than grass anywhere else in the school. In the afternoon, cricket matches were packed and blinchers and grandsand had scarcity and empty spots. Cricket was not a game that I knew anything about before coming to Omaha. Over time, I began to appreciate that this was a very important global sport and that it was very popular in literacy every part of the British Empire. The school master referred to the game as one of the gentlemen and made sure Omar here Atlantis played it properly. Dressed in immaculate white shirt and trouser, gloves, knee high pads, and helmet. I was not known for my athletic ability, but Chiki Mama and Christopher Okibo were particular good batsmen and bowlers of the sport. Christopher Okibo was a very extraordinary person. He was two years before me, but Christopher was not one to allow two years to get in this in his way. He quickly became one of my closest friends. He was born in Ojoto in Anambra State and came from a highly thoroughly talented family, part of the so-called Okibo trio of intellectual giants that included his older brother, the late legendary economist, Dr. Pius Okibo, and their caution, Professor Bede Okibo, the renewer and agronomist Christopher was just as somebody you would not ignore or suppress. He struck people because he was so energetic and so fearless. He was something he was somebody who would walk into a room, sit down and start learning to play the school piano without any prior exposure. He had an inmate understanding of what was required to play the instrument. Without without the regimented Tutor, tutors, out hoarders lesson. Christopher was a talented artist and a sport hero. And he had a keen mind that won him the administration of many of the British schoolmasters. He quickly became very popular throughout Omaha. His reputation for mischievous exploit pleased him. I think the first time he got the attention of the entire school was when the principal, William Simpson, decided that there was a lot of food waste coming from the kitchen. In the other words, it seems we were being given too much food to, to eat. Simon decided to give food, not according to one's academy years. The puppies in the highest class were given more food than those in the junior classes. Samson left that this practice was not a very good idea, and that he and that it led to a waste of food. A better arrangement, he 
taught was for people to be given food according to their weight before we knew what was happening. Christopher was was Christopher, who was slightly built, had talked with the teening prefect. And we noticed that he was now in the food equivalent of heavy weights, receiving more food than his classmates. There was a strong culture of meristocracy hard and very high of instruction at Umar here. I quickly noticed that there were very brilliant, bright boys in my class. Yet, there was a sense of friendly compassion, competition that pervaded our academic life, perfected our academic life. I made friends gradually at school, at first mainly with puppies I met in the dormitory. Then, with a number of others in the classroom, through our partnership, that the class master set up for assignment and project. Benjamin Uzochuku became one of my closest friend at the beginning of the first semester. He later qualified as an engineer. After studying in Great Britain, he became the director of the Federal Department of Public Works in Lagos. Ebu Etienne Inyan was another close friend. He was one of my most brilliant classmate. He became a, phys a physician, but unfortunately, he later committed to suicide. He was, he, uh, we had very different backgrounds, especially in terms of religion. When he arrived at Umahia, the school official discovered that he had not been baptized most of all did not ask fellow populace whether they were baptized or not. One, but assume that if you were a Christian, you would have been. But Inyang's father was not a particular religious person. So when he had become an upper classmate, Inyang decided to be baptized. And after subjecting himself to the religion classes and preparation that were required for him, he asked me to be his godfather. So uh, I had a godson who was the same age as mine. That was quite an extraordinary move, moving gesture on his part to ask me to step in on his behalf. This capacity, six of us, including Inyan and me, were promoted to the second year. From the first year class during our second term at Omohia student, with a record of excellent work and who were the best performing in their respective year were combined into a larger second second school class. It was an honor, but it also meant that I began to see a large majority of my com contemporaries, contem contem contemporaries from my first year class less often, including my close friend Ben Uzochuku and Chike Mona. English was the language of instruction at government college. Omar here, I repeat, 
English was the language of the instruction of the government college, Omaha. It was at Omaha that I first truly understood the power and the importance of what unifying language. The, school, the schoolmaster were aware that Nigeria had over 250 ethnic groups, had very carefully enrolled students from every nook and cranny of the nation, where possibly why African language and writing should be developed, nurtured, and preserved. How else? I would wonder later, would I have been able to communicate with so many boys from different parts of the country and, and ethnic groups speaking different languages? Had we not been taught one language? Many of our teachers at that time were alumni from Cambridge, the University of London, and other major British institutes of high learning. They include APL Stella, who was fondly called Apple, by his close associates and a few of us who were his former students. Short after I left Omaha, the duo R.H. Stone, a biological instructor, and A.B. Dotson, a one-time a one-time principal of college, arrived together Stone and Cousins, published a very famous biology textbook called Biology for Tropical School that was used throughout Africa and beyond. William Shaker Pierce. I was it was at Omar here that I continued the introduction to the her to the work of William Shaker Pierce that my father had first made possible as well as to Booker T. Washington of from slavery shift. Olivia Travels, Dick Sands, David Copperfield, and Stevenson Treasure Iceland. We were blessed to have had energetic egalitarian principles such as the revered Robert Fisher and W. C. Symptoms, who created and encouraged respectively, the Textbook Act. A time between 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. when all textbooks had to be put away and novel picked up and read. Reading these books was a transforming experience and I had written elsewhere about the the influence Omaha had in education. Many of the pianos of modern African literacy, Vincent Joko, Ike, Christopher, Okiwe, Elichi, Amadi, INC, Anyebo, Chike Mona, Gabriel, Op Op Okara, and Letta Ken Saru. We were less often started is the role the school play in producing leaders, leaders in the fine arts, such as Ben and Vol. The and uh, sorry, I repeat. Let me repeat that again. Let me repeat. Such as Ben and Wu 
and politics, such as Jaja Wachuku, Nigerian first speaker of the House of Representatives and later ambassador to the United Nations, Omar here, turned out other tears, such as Okoye Aribo, Dr. E. M. L. Elder and N.U. Atman. The school also produced respective African intellectuals, such as the Grunios Professor Bede Okibo, the physician and the first Republic Minister of Health, J. O. J. Okeze Chu. Okogu, a former Minister of Finance, Kensley Harrison, a renowned, a renowned professor of obstetrics and musician, and Professor Lars Igweme, among others. We went through uh, the designated courses in secondary school, and the last examination that we took was the Cambridge School Certificate exam. There were four classifications of grades, a four distinction C for credits, P for pass, and F for fail. Most pupils of Omaha pass all their subjects. I passed my school certificate exam with five distinctions and one credit. In Yang passed with six distinctions and one credit. I narrowly graduated top of the class only because the distinction that I got was higher in the course that I took despite the fact that Ivan had more as in more courses. What are the keys I had Mr. Inya in great esteem, especially as he had an A in literature, while I had a credit. As I was completing my secondary school education at Government College of Mahia, and the colonial government announced that it was predisposed to building a university college in West Africa, there was some kind of competition. Would it be in the Gold Coast present day Ghana? Or in Nigeria? So a high powered mission under Walter Elliott was sent to survey the situation on the ground. Such was the reputation of government college on Maya was the Commission paid us a visit to spend a while to spend the whole weekend at our school. Most of them came to chapel service on Sunday morning, but Julian Huxley, the biologist, roamed our extinct ground, watching exotic birds with binoculars. The Ellos Commission report led to the foundation of Nigeria's first university institution, a university college at Ibadan, in a, a special relationship with London. I finished secondary school and, lit and literally walked into University College, Ibadan. Well, maybe not walked in. There was a nationwide examination. I came in first or second in the second in this in the country. I won what was called a major scholarship. I grew up at a time when the colonial education infrastructure mm -hmm. celebrated hard work and high achievement. And so did our families and communities. Government College Omaha was so proud of my work 
that they put up a big sign announcing my performance in the national entrance examination. That noticed it in the well for years. My family was very pleased with my school performance from the end of prim primary school through to this time. No matter what, no matter, no matter that I was not known for my athletic ability, they encouraged me to read voraciously, taking great pleasure in my nickname dictionary. A very distinct, this a very distinct wise member of, of the colonial education system, a British gentleman who was also the chairman of some important colonial council, heard about my entrance examination result and came to our house to greet me. Now, I have never encountered such a thing before. Surely people of that distinction did not call on child children, children but here was this man who was a very important person in the British educational system who thought that my work deserved encouragement, recognition, and a visit from him. So he clearly and I had a good beginning as a young man, surrounded by all this existing excitement. It seems as if the British were planning surprise for me at every turn, including the construction construction of a new university. It is of course only a joke, but I am sure many of my colleagues colleagues share similar feelings. Here we were a whole generation of a student who really could not have had any clear idea of going to university until this event began to unfold. It was a remarkable group, Chikemona, Flora, Mwape, Mabel, Segun, Ben, Ubumselu, Emmanuel, Obiechina, Kesley, Harrison, Gemeria, on also the one day Abimbola Ia Abubakar Adele Afibo Igwe Aja Machuku Chofilus Adele King Akinyele Grace Adele Williams Muhammad Bello Elechi Amadi A bit later so Wole Soyinka, DJP Clark, Oluwo Kanyo, Oshonto, MJC, Echerum, Christopher, Okibo, Ayo, Babosa, Christine Okole, my future wife, Emeka Anyoku. Chuku Wemeka Ike Abiola Irele Zulu Sophia and several others. These young men and women came from all over the country, from early schools, modeled on the public secondary of England government colony. Umahia Dennis Memorial Grammar School. Government College, Ibadan, and Abiyokuta King's College, Lagos and Queen's College. The Ibadan experience. The Ibadan experience. Good. Yeah. Yeah. The Ibadan experience. The Ibadan experience. Omeha had a large 
contingent of students admitted to University College Ibadan with a number of students winning, winning at least minor scholarship. I received my scholarship to study medicine at Ibadan. I wanted to be in the arts, but felt pressure to choose medicine instead. After a year of work, I changed to English, history, and theology. But by so doing, I lost the bursary and was left with the prospect of paying tuition. I remember what the dean of the Faculty of Art, Professor E. A. Kadu said to me when I went when I went to ask to be moved from the science to the art. In order to get into the art, I had to have taken a school certificate exam in Latin, which was not taught at Omaha. I was faced with a difficult dilemma and spent some time thinking about the ramification of taking extra courses in Latin. But Providence had other plans soon after my conversion with Professor Kadu, an announcement came through from the University of London. Our parents instructed indicating that it was dropping the Latin requirement for additional into faculty arts. The University of London argued that the native language of students from the Britain Commonwealth could stand in for the Latin requirement. I was elected. I went back and asked Professor Kandu for admission into the arts faculty. He brought out my files and told me that I was admitted on the basics of my performance in physics and chemistry. He wanted reassurance from me that I would be able to make such a fundamental shift in academic focus and maintaining good grades. After a little more conversation, he had admitted me to study English, history, and theology, and I moved from medicine to the art faculty. My older brother, Augustine Achebe, an engineer by training, had returned from his studies in England and had learned a good job. On learning that I had lost my Bursary. Augustine gave me money he had saved up for his annual leave so that I would pay the university tuition and continue my studies, which I did. Very pleasantly, after graduation, I did not have to worry about where I would go next. The system was so well organized. And that, as well, left university. Most of us were instantly absorbed into civil service academy, business, or industry. We trusted I did anywhere the country and its ruler to provide us proprietary education and then a job to serve my nation. I was not. Disappointed, I went home to my village at the end of the holiday and visited a secondary school within my district called the Merchant of Life School in Auburn. Near Ogidi, I asked the principal to give me a job as an English teacher, and he did. He helped, he helped that, he helped that my colleague, J.O.C. Ezilo, had completed a short, a short 
tenor at the same school and recommended it to me. Ezilo is often described as Nigerian's leading mathematician alongside Chike Obi. Ezilo graduated from University of London in 1953 with a first class honors in mathematicians and amazing feat by any measure and particularly extraordinary for the time he would go on receive his PhD from Queen's College University of Cambridge in 1958, and then rise rapidly through the Nigerian Academy rank to become vice chancellor of the University of Nigeria, Shaka, and several other Nigerian institutions higher learning. Now we are meeting Christy and her family. This is going to be the last page on this episode one. So, uh, you see, this is the last page of this episode one before we call it a wrap. Meeting Christy and her family. The secondary building at Merchants of Life School was a disrepair and had a very small library. I would often encourage my students to read by my bringing in a copy of newspaper of by making a few more books from my own library available to them. Like most young people, they were enthusiastic and interested puppies. I spent about four months at this job. It was known to all that this would be a temporary position. What the Americans call a summer job. Because I had my eyes farther afield. A few months later in 1954, I was notified of a job opening at what was then called the Nigerian Broadcasting Service, NBS, in Enugu. I was offered a voice by the search committee of common to English to interview or having them come to me. I remember feeling quite entitled by this choice and proceeded to enjoy the privilege by asking them to come to me, which they did. The team of mainly Bristol left to no return to Enugu after an hour or so for an interview question. About a week or so later, I received a letter in the mail offering me a job. So I moved to Enugu. I enjoyed my stint at the broadcasting house promotion came rapidly and within a very short period of time i had become the control controller of the nigerian broadcasting service eastern region after the end of the academic year during the long vacation the nbs offered summer job to college students on vacations they did not pay very well, but provided young people with exposure to the world of journalism. Broadcasting and newspaper reporting in the years was in inaugurated with a large number of applicants during this particular long vacation. Not only students from my alma mater, university, college, a pattern, but from those returning from studies abroad. A few weeks later, one could hear the unmistakable banter of young people as they milled about the normally quiet hall of the Nigerian Broadcasting Service as a controller. I had very little interaction with them with the student. 
I found all this excited commotion, amusing, and got on with my work. But soon after I was, I was told by my secretary that a delegation of university students wanted to speak with me about a matter of great importance. The students took into my office and led by their leader, Christy Okoli. She was a, a beautiful young woman and very articulated. And when she spoke, she caught my attention. I was spellbound. I grieved tone. she announced the complaint of the students. There was one student whose salary was higher than all the others, and they wanted equal pay for equal time. I was kindly disposed towards them and made sure that all of the students received the same ramification for the work that they did. My interest in Christy grew rapidly into desire to get to know her better. I discovered, for instance, that she was from the ancient town of Oka, the present-day capital of Anambra State, Anambra, Anambra State. Oka held a soft spot in my heart because it is, it was my mother's hometown. And it was known through Igbo land and beyond for its skilled artisans and blacksmiths who fashioned bronze, wood, metal, gavings of a bond and halting beauty. The two years into our friendship, Christian and I were engaged. Christian was from a very prominent Oka family. She was the daughter of one of the most formidable Igbo men of the early 20th century, Timothy Chuku Okadibe Okoli and Mbeyo Matilda Mo, who unfortunately died not long after Christian was born. T.C. Okoli was, as she was, widely known as she was widely known widely known was the son of a famous Dibia or traditional medicine man known from Arochoku to Unri from Onicha to Ogoja for skills and that encompassed herbal medicine mysterious divination and magic after a lifetime in the service of the ancient medical practice, Okoli gave his son the, the name Chuku Chuku Okadibia, which means God is greater than a traditional medicine man. He encouraged his newborn son to seek a Christian life, an early convert to Christian, Christian in Igbo land, T.C. Okoli was one of the few educated men of his time to attain the position of senior postmaster in the colonial post and telecommunication, P and T. Department, he was proudly generous man and used his resource, which was equipped standing for a Nigerian at that time to sponsor the education of gifted children from schools or family in Oka. When he died in at 102 in the midst of 1980s, all 13 villages of the town celebrated his life for several days through both traditional and Christian rites and festival. Meeting Christie's father for the first time was a great thrill for me. His compound in Orca was also full of 
laughter. People visited constantly, some to drink and some to make merries. Others were famous and to pay their respect. I belong to the later category we arrived and Christianity promptly took me to meet her father. Papa, she said, Michi no Achebe. We spoke hands and we shook hands and then they pleasantly gave away to a brief interview. Where are you from? Yara. What do you do? Where do you do? Where do you go to school? Where are your parents? I quickly discovered that T.C. Okoli was an Anglophilia. He took pleasure in reciting passages in English from scripture, shakapers, and poetry, and he had sent several of his children off to England to advance their education. He was also a deeply respectful and kind man who left me with a lasting lesson that I have never forgotten. Christian and I were talking one evening when Okoli walked into the conversation while sipping wine. Watching the two of us walk, talk, by this time, I would say confidently that we like that he liked me. We got along very well, but in the course of the conversation, he missed something Christy said and asked for clarification. At this prompting, I responded by saying, justify me in Igbo, rapia ka ona aba. Don't, in English, don't mind her waging her Jews. Don't mind her. T.C. Okoli set up and rebuked me. He said, don't say or imply that what someone else has to say or is saying is not worth attending or listening into. To. It immediately struck me that I had to be careful about the way I handle someone else's words or opinion, especially Christie's, even when there was strong disagreement, one had to remember to be discordant with respect. So thank you very much for uh, joining this program to read from this book, uh, Chino Achebe. It is my great pleasure to read through this and um, also bring it to the light of the world so that we can be able to read from it because there are a lot of things that we people of the indigenous people of Afra have to learn from this because current situation is letting us to try to revisit the past and try to see where we can fix one or two things together. Thank you very much. I still remember the innocent thing can remember more. Good night. Mm -hmm.